Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, one of the things that really excites me um, as a game designer, watching the practice of other game designers, is when someone sort of takes on a really interesting and specific challenge um, or looks at some kind of gap in uh, the games that are being made. Uh, Samantha Coleman, our next speaker, uh, is an artist and a technologist, a programmer, sound designer, game designer. Is there anything you don't do? Is to how are, are you a good cook? Are you? <laughs> no, really? OK, all right, excellent. Well, never mind then. <laughs> um, uh, she had a very successful Kickstarter recently for a game called Centrist, uh, which I'm really interested in because uh, I think it's, it's doing uh, a lot of interesting stuff, trying to figure out how to make games, a music game that actually feels a lot more like making music, um, which seems to feel like it's a gap. But uh, as we all know, when you take on uh, a difficult challenge, there is uh, a lot of failure. And sometimes that's the best thing about taking on a difficult challenge is the failure and learning from it. So today she's going to talk about uh, what she's learned from making Centris and give us uh, insight into how that game has been uh, developed uh, over the last uh, year or so. So Samantha, come on up. Thank you, Charles. I'm going to adjust this thing real quick. and. Um, I've been like, since the Kickstarter, I've been kind of addicted to social media. So if you'll humor me for a moment, um, you know, smile for the camera. Uh, and uh, let's do this thing. I'm going to tweet that shit out right now. Good. So yes, I'm Samantha. And um, I've been working on this game, Centris, in its current incarnation for about a year and a half. Hey, that's Steam. Um, and um, where are my notes? I'm at practice, this is exciting. Um, yeah, I've been working on this incarnation of Centris for about a year and a half. Um, it's been a much longer project than that in terms of uh, exploring, the, the exploring the space of musicality and uh, rich musical experiences in games, um, kind of starting from my love of res um, and sort of trying to pay attention as the game has evolved over a long time. Um, so I, I had some slides, but uh, I decided to just use game builds as slides instead. So uh, I have a bunch of builds of Centris um, from various prototypes over the last couple of years. And um, I figure we should jump in right away. Uh, I just want to mention that, um, yeah, I mean, the the, 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 there's a couple builds I won't show, which are the earliest from, from longer ago than I care to mention, because it's a really long time, and it's kind of embarrassing that I haven't like finished yet. Um, but uh, it started as a shooter, right? It started as a clone of Res, um, but I was really inspired by the degree of musicality in Res, and I thought that hey, why can't a game do more to enable me to like have an incredible amount of influence over the music? So that was kind of the starting point for the project. Um, this is a. This is a version of the game. For a long time, it was called Project Subdivision. Um, and I put it aside for a couple of years. I worked on it for about a year, and then I put it aside for a couple of years while I worked for Unity in Denmark. And um, then, then um, played in a band and kind of had a revelation, and then um, kind of inherited the Project Subdivision name and, and took this into, uh, into uh, this is early 2011. So what the hell is going on here? Um, I can um, kind of t use the mouse, move the mouse back and forth to select these different lanes. I can click the mouse. And a couple of things happen. I get a sound, and I get some color block appearing. And I can do this a couple of times. I can change to a different lane. Um, and so as it loops around, uh, you can see that there's a clock-like playhead. And it just plays the sound again. So this allows you to sort of like um, just kind of do whatever. It's very toy-like. Um, there's also the, the, the letters that you see are the key. It's like the home row of the keyboard. So I can use the keyboard to kind of correspond to each lane. Um, so the, the idea with this was that you have a kind of Simon Says mechanic where the outermost ring of colors is like y your golden path or, or the perfect solution. And then you're trying to build something one note at a time that matches that. Um, and when you do, uh, then, it, uh, then it moves on to the next puzzle, the next part of the song. Uh, so then 
throughout multiple um, stages, you have a fully uh, a, a song with like a complete progression from beginning, middle, end. Um, this build's ridiculously hard, and those mechanics that I just explained to, to you have uh, have no visibility or transparency at all. So this was. Uh, a, a ridiculous failure. Um, I, I I applied or I submitted this. I'll just even like vary up the sounds a little bit. Um, so when you when you drop a note, it actually overlaps whatever was there. So it has this kind of like invisible system where um, sometimes it's still playing. If if you overlap the first kind of block of a note, then it will replace that note and kind of remove it completely. Um, but if you overlap sort of the, the middle onward, then you'll still get both sounds, but it's like this weird obscured like uh, visibility into like what's happening with the visuals and the sounds. There's a big disconnect there. Um, and it's like ridiculously hard to get the right patterns. There's very specific kinds of rhythms and sequences that you have to get in order, and um, it's just not easy to discover. And it's very, very frustrating to get there along the way. Um, so I submitted this to the Experimental Game Workshop in 2011 and was, um, was rejected. So I failed to get into the EGW. And um, that, was a, that, was, that was a big disappointment. So, um, but I, I got some encouragement and so I got some advice from, uh, actually I was, uh, I was pretty privileged at that time, even at that very early stage. And as a very unknown developer, I got some good advice from Jonathan Blow. Um, about the state of it and sort of gave me some visibility into why it might not have been accepted into the EGW. So um, I, I actually just read through that, that thread with him yesterday and looking back, like I really appreciate that, uh, that advice and uh, it was exactly what I needed to hear even though it kind of like set me uh, a little bit off center at the time. Um, uh, it was basically uh, that the that the game like elements were not apparent enough, and it seemed more like it basically it seemed more like a kind of early art project than a game. And so when I read that at the time, it was um, like, oh, John Blow just said that my game's not a game, but he it was actually not what he said. And um, but but that was like what I needed to hear, and it was actually helpful to consider to keep moving forward. With, with the game is like, okay, now I have something to prove. Like, this is a game, and it's my job to explain why. So I kept working. Um, um, I actually, actually, now looking back, like with all the things that I've learned, um, to have my game perceived as more art than game tells me that I was on exactly the right track. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is the next ver version of the game. Uh-oh, I might have broken it. Okay. I had this thing, Studio Organic, which I've, is gone now. Um, but that had this big, crazy logo. So this was what I did next, Sen. And um, it was, um, so the idea was the, the, the name Project Subdivision uh, changed into Sensory Overflow. And then Sensory Overflow got reduced to Sen, which was just kind of a cool little name um, that, I, that I thought. And so like I practiced doing logo design. I practiced kind of like, um, figuring out the visual language um, of the game. Um, this was supposed to be a mobile game. This was like uh, still very early 2011, so for sec maybe second quarter 2011. And so I was like, okay, iPhone's big, like music game on iPhone. There's a huge opportunity. So I'll put these buttons. You hold, you hold the, you hold the damn thing like a controller, and then you just have the buttons on the side of the screen, and that, and so that way you can like. You know, push these different buttons. They're different instruments. Yeah, let's rock out to this. Yeah, right. So like also like you can see that it shares some similarities with that first prototype, but there's a lot that's different here. So um I had um I had some help kind of like figuring out like how to 
in the first in that first version all of the sounds that are available to you like this this like sequences of sounds that you have available to put into the song to you know you use these pieces one at a time to build a song and um, so I thought to put them on the outside try to visualize the colors of them with you know some some sort of like sequenced pattern um, and trying to indicate like with the triangles that this is the next one and that when you when you click it it moves forward so this one has a sequence of green and yellow, and it just goes back and forth between green and yellow. Um, each one, in this version, each one of, uh, so I was trying to visualize more clearly the relationship between uh, what you're seeing and what you're hearing. So an uh, analogy of a four track sequencer came out in this one. Um, each track, like each layered concentric circle is a, is a specific instrument. So, and they correlate to each of the, uh, the, I don't have a name for these weird button things that are on the sides. But if, if I push this top one, it always shoots to the top most outer circle. And this bottom one always goes to the innermost circle. Um, but people didn't get that. That was something that just confused the hell out of people and they didn't know how to, um, they didn't know how to control it and they oftentimes didn't even know what was going on. Um, so the rules of this are like a kind of composited color matching rule. So you can see that, well, I just did it because I had my opportunity and I didn't want to wait for the whole thing to come around again. Um, you have this color pattern in the center. And what this is asking you to do is put that color somewhere, uh, like radially, um, on one of the tracks. So, and if it, if you do, then it will, it will kind of give you another, like Simon says, like, yes, you just did it. So I put the orange on the out, outermost circle, and then I get this, this area of white that's saying like, hey, you matched it. Um, uh, actually, it's kind of funny, like I've realized like throughout doing this that like I was kind of using like a, a trope of using lighter colors or bright colors or even white to indicate like success and I discovered that this is actually problematic language when I was trying to describe it to people. So like there's parts where like, you're trying to turn these black parts white. And then I was like, oh my God, what did I just say? <laughs> um, and, so, and so I've tried to become super, like I didn't, I didn't think about that at all at first, but then I've tried to become super conscious about that aspect of it. And how can I show, um, how can I show like success and like positive state versus negative state without relying on this like dark and light motif? Um, so anyway, let's move on. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say about that? Um, so I made that build to, um, to submit to this congregate contest that was um, going to be judged by Tetsuya Mizuguchi if you got in the top 10 or something. I came in, uh, and, and of course, loving Rez, uh, he's the creator of Rez, I really wanted his attention on my game because I thought that he would see that it was something special. Um, I came in like 16th for that for that contest so didn't get the game in front of him um, also I think it's important to say that during during this period um, a lot a lot of this game was made um, while I was recovering from surgery and I was dealing with a really severe breakup so in a way um, devoting myself to this game and this idea and these systems and the code um, actually kept me alive while I was dealing with depression. So that was a really big deal and it was like hard, like really, really hard, but uh, it was like this was all I had at the moment. So, um, but when it didn't, when it didn't, um, it didn't really catch on at all. Like people, t a couple people tweeted about it, my friends retweeted my tweets. Um, I think like a thousand people played within the first month and um, there was very little feedback and it was like two negative comments and one positive comment. And um, that was just like, oh my God, what am I doing? So I was like creatively burnt out um, and um, I was emotionally burnt out. And uh, so I, and then I just felt like this game had been like failing over and over and over again. And um, what was I gonna do? So I, was, I started doing some contract work on Gravity Ghost and that helped me kind of like stay a little bit creatively engaged, but at the end of it all, like I was out of money and I was out of juice. So um, I started, um, I, I needed to look for a job. Um, 
I had this one idea before I got a job at Amazon, which was why couldn't, um, so in, in this, this is, a, this is a very short prototype that I did where you have the same kind of basic visual language, but you can see the selected, you can see the selected note before you drop it. So as I select each one of these sequences, it appears on the outside, and then when I push the button again, it gets inserted. And you can hear it's the same sound, and it's still, it's still very slow, and it's the same like puzzle mechanics of matching like the composited, the composited, uh, composited match. Um, but just this little bit of seeing things move from outside to inside uh, was kind of like an amazing moment um, to where, where the game fundamentally changed into something that felt more responsive and readable than, um, than it had been in uh, leading up to that point, which was a couple of years. Um, so, but I, I, I had to, so I really, when I got the job at Amazon, I ended up doing first um, quality assurance testing and then um, prototype development on the Fire Phone. And um, um, it was a good situation because I was learning how to do rapid iterations on prototypes and how to explore ideas very quickly. Um, but I signed a contract that forbid me from working on any projects outside of Amazon without them owning it. And um, that was a huge mistake. Um, it, it led to me, um, it was 18 months that I worked for them. And it was, I mean, it was a blessing in disguise because I was able to save up money and then kind of feel like I still have this thing I want to return to. Um, and I will. But um, for, for some time, it was very much um, a period of like, I want to do this, but I can't. And um, some of the boundaries, like some of the, 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 the constraints within that job kind of made me more motivated to like want to you know, scratch my own creative itch. So um, uh, creative suffocation is the, wor is the phrase that I, I, I use for what I was going through. And um, um, I, I mean, I did like a molly jam where you, I made a silly game about a pigeon that's trying to save salarymen from jumping off of uh, skyscrapers. Um, and, um, and then I saw the Double Fine Adventure and Kickstarter and you know chipped in 100 bucks for that and um, started getting the backer videos and um, like remembering how much I loved Full Throttle. And, um, and so, but still like watching this game kind of come together, uh, also with an interest in crowdfunding I, that I'd had for, for some time. Um, just watching how this happened, there came a point when I saw one documentary episode where they were they had an, they had done this kind of like uh, they had brought all the the visual artists the um, the concept artists into the studio in uh, in double at the Double Fine Studio, and then they had followed all these artists home to to their studios in in New York, a couple of here in New York, and then um, one in the San Juan Islands in my neighborhood, you know, my, my, not my neighborhood, but in my area. And just the peek into their process and how they would collaborate and, and how they would, you know, thrash ideas and develop ideas and throw away ideas. Um, and then like how they set up their own creative spaces, I thought was so inspiring that I was like, I have to do this. Like, I, I want that so bad. Um, so at the suggestion of my therapist, I started reading this book called The Artist's Way. Uh, it's by Julia Cameron. Uh, she's from New York. And um, uh, it is a book that I have come to um, hold, like, uh, it's utterly divine, this book. Um, it is, uh, and it's something that I recommend to all creative people, The Artist's Way. It's about maximizing your own creativity and um, getting over creative blocks. And, um, and how to work through the issues that sort of knot up inside all of us that enable you to move beyond kind of your own um, damage, your own creative damage, which we all receive. Um, great, so uh, I wanted to go back to Centris. This is oh, messed up here. Um, I wanted to go back to Centris, and or, or, I wanted to go back to independent game development, but I had all this issue, I had all this like stuff around Centris. Um, and when I went independent in April, I took a couple of months to do a couple of different prototypes. I did an art thing called Trace, which I can show you later if you want to see. Um, and I did a couple. I did like a racing game prototype, very very blah blah blah. But um, 
the game kept speaking to me. Like I, Sen was coming out to me, like kind of in my dreams or in in my in my daydreams or in just in conversation, and um, I found myself like saying like I should be working on this, um, and then like what like why? Uh, I, I needed to like put that aside, but the game like it wouldn't let me go, right? It was like something that I just felt the 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 business was too unfinished, and I needed to return to it. So with all this kind of like. Um, <sighs> like baggage that I'd built up with this project, like through lots and lots of things, um, I kind of went back into this creative ambiguity and started prototyping again. I threw away, uh, I threw away the code base that you saw and um, from all the previous builds and started over um, with a little bit more of, a, of an intensity around like how do I rapidly explore ideas and answer my own questions and give myself confidence that this is gonna work. So I built this over, um, the summer last year, um, it was about four months, and um, but I had a, I had a prototype that I could use to evaluate within a week. I don't have a build of that to show you, but it was like there were no circles in that build. Like that was specifically about testing out uh, the stacking mechanic that that you saw, um, and like a, a new way, like a replacement puzzle system for like this composited weirdness thing. So um, here's Centris debut prototype. Cool, so you can see some similarities already, but when I push space, everything begins. The difference here is that the targets are literally positioned. So you don't have to think about like this, what's this like relationship between this inner goal and like the outer position of the block. The revelation was, I just need to put the targets, like just say to the player, like put the fucking blocks right here. Like just put the blocks here and you'll be fine. Then when you solve the puzzle, it changes super fast. And then you also get another instrument. So this gets hard because um, there's a, a lot uh, that happens. There's a lot that happens in between when you start and when you end the, the puzzles. Um, it's very easy. So so like every time you fill in a block, it's like one one or two more percent toward meeting the goal. But if you make one mistake, which is a timing and like rhythmical based mistake, you can actually undo like several steps worth of work, and that's actually incredibly fatiguing. And it happened here when I was trying to do like the two bl blue blo blocks right here, um, I stepped on my own toes. So now, um, now I have to approach the puzzle solution a little bit, like I have to step back with my thinking about like where to put blocks. So let me just do this really quick. Uh, yeah. the, the, pro the problem with this one is that um, I was trying to get players to think one step ahead too soon. So because everything stacks from the outside to inside, you actually have to think about positioning blocks from the inside out, whereas it's the most obvious to just, well, you have something that's very close to the outside edge. You can see it. It's right there. I'm going to focus on that first. But then it becomes harder to get everything into position because in order to get something past that outer block, you have to move that position of the outer block. Oh, 
Oh, you see, oh, do you see that? I just did that, okay. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. So like, but, but, but like one of the things that like revealed itself to me about the design of the game is that um, 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 like the stacking inside out and then, um, oh no, I'm, it's too early, I just had it. Um, gosh dang it. So, that's like the worst faux pas I can make. Like the thing that I was, that really learned was, <laughs> um, um, uh, gosh. The magical thing about that is that the as the blocks naturally layer on top of each other, unexpected musicalities appear. So so chords uh, emerge in a dynamic way and in a, in an organic way, and it's actually the player's own chord. It's not a chord that I've given you to play perfectly here. You did it. Like whether or not it was intentional, you did it. And in the, in that version, it's usually not intentional because there's um, there's not a clear relationship between the colors and the sounds. So, um, looking back, like I got, a, I actually, you know, that was a year that I finished that build just over a year ago. And looking, and I've been doing a lot of other explorations, which we'll look at. Um, um, but I, I'm realizing now that I got a lot of things right in that prototype that I didn't expect. Um, yeah, so moving on. Uh, I did I did the Kickstarter. I did the Seattle Indies Expo as my, my first playtesting opportunity. That gave me the confidence to the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter was a month of living hell to like try to convince people why it was worth giving me 20 bucks to make this game, uh, like 1,500 people, why it was worth that. Um, so that build, then that Kickstarter campaign was successful in that it was funded, but it was a failure in that, of, you know, there were still 50,000 people that could have uh, funded it, but didn't. So um, that's not good percentages, right? 1,500 versus 50,000. Um, so uh, basically I had a lot of things on my mind about the game that I wanted to continue to explore. Um, so I started making these prototypes for um, my backers. I did this silly like prototyping project thing. It was like a backer exclusive forum, and um, and this was part of the campaign. Like, hey, I'm a prototyper. Like, you'll get these awesome prototypes. Um, and I started like building these prototypes specifically to answer questions. So this was a free play prototype because I didn't have an idea about like how to do free play versus puzzles when it's already kind of so free form. Um, and uh, I also wanted to clarify or establish a relationship between color and pitch. So in this, this is the donut prototype. You can um, go left and right through these sequences and then it will visualize which block you have selected very close to the grid. Um, you can select these different rows um, and uh, it's a scale. Each one of these is a scale. So there's that, um, and then you can just like uh, play around and make something, whatever. There's no puzzle in this build at all, and um, and it sounds really bad. Um, <laughs> so like a tinny and like me. So um, uh, uh, I also did this thing called the buffer, where you can actually stack up a chord um, like this and then um, play that whole chord. Okay, wait for it, wait for it. Yeah! <laughs> um, cool, and then there's also like, uh, I wanted to like expose key signatures, so I, I, this, this build includes an entirely new musical system. The, that first debut prototype was like hard-coded linear sequence of sounds, sound files that get played, sound samples. This one uses essentially like a chromatic 12-step scale run through a key signature filter to retrieve the samples that you need so that I could do things like change key signature dynamically. So if I move the mouse, I can select A, and I can also turn up the volume with the mouse. Oop, that's the same one, sorry.
This is a, like a failed section of my of my presentation right now because I'm trying to show how the key signatures change, but I'm not doing very well. So come play this after. I don't want to like hang out on that build. The, uh, 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 people don't understand key signatures if they don't already understand key signatures. And um, this was like trying to com like merge like many key signatures together. I think this actually demonstrated a really nice failure of this build, where when you have com com when you have multiple key signatures in play at once, you can get these incredibly atonal. Uh, and unpleasant sounds. So, and this is kind of like at the core of this entire game's exploration is how do you give somebody the 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 uh, the actual freedom to make music without letting them make something that they don't like. So, if you give someone that much freedom, it's very likely that they'll make something that they don't that this like kind of sounds bad. And so, how do you how do you do that? And um, I'm not sure I know yet. Um, Cool, so that was the donut prototype. The pitch is color, new audio system, covered it. Moving on. Um, right, so the next was, this is a, this is a pre-alpha one. I didn't have a good name for this build, um, but um, this is uh, what I took to PAX East and GDC. Autoplay, autoplay. It plays itself, you don't even have to play the game. You can just turn it on and just sit there. Um, this was um, like a, an iteration on the grid. Um, this still uses the same sort of like, you, you can see the block that you have selected, but it's been changed into, uh, you can see the entire sequence. So it's the same thing in many ways. You have several sequences of instruments and you can select between the different sequences. You get this kind of motion where, um, like the problem of, like, of angles is that angles change as they get closer to the center. So. Um, um, I needed to be able to, to let players predict how large each block was going to be, and that meant showing it as close to the grid as possible. So even though you have this outer sequence selected, um, I still try to like, you know, float it close to the grid. This is also two player, so there's a left player side and a right player side, um, and they, there's two different playheads. So whereas previously everything was always playing at 12 o'clock, now you have player one at 12 o'clock, player two at 6 o'clock. Um, let's play it. Cool. So what just happened there? So this is a, a, a new, um, a new like iteration on the targets. Um, I really love the idea of like having no perfect solution, right? So every music game out there is like, do this exact sequence of things at this exact right timing, and you know then you get points. Um, and so I call them perfect performance games. And I wanted to have puzzles that are about like position and order that don't require you to have like that just rejects perfection, like across the board. Um, so with these puzzles, it, in this red area where the red block is kind of shining, um, you can put a red, a red block anywhere in there. And as long as you have one, of the, one block of the matching color inside that area, that target is satisfied. Um, and so this allows for like a huge amount of variability in the way the solutions sound. I also did this weird thing where like the kind of the, 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 the targets expand unless like they still, you can still see them kind of from the periphery um, and they actually trigger automated drums. So um, I can have a little bit of like growth of rhythm, rhythm throughout the levels. Um, but that was all like completely invisible to the players. Um, when you solve a puzzle, the, 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 the blocks all turn gray um, to denote that although they still contribute to the music, they no longer contribute to solving the puzzle in front of you. Um, that didn't read. And the kind of like broad ranges for the targets didn't read. People would try to fill a red area with like all red blocks. And red blocks are all the same pitch. So you get like this like like burst of like a C note like right here or like several at once. And it's like, ah, God, this is, ah. You're not, you're not, player, you're not playing right. How do you not know that this is what's going on here? So. Um, Cool. So, but this was like two-player. Yeah, the two-player mode was really, uh, really successful. Um, 
But I mean, this this game at this stage still suffers from this um, uh, attribute of like total enig enigma. So people would walk by at PAX East. It was at the mini booth, and um, they'd kind of be like, "What is that?" And they would like stop and stare at it. And then some of them would come up and play just to be like, "What is this thing? Like, how do I do this? I'm I'm interested, but I don't understand." Um, and some people would just be like, "I have no idea," and walk on. Um, and let's see. Um, even people that played it would often say that they didn't totally understand what was happening, um, but they were enjoying it, so I kept going. This, at this stage, the game also started to re um, reveal some, this is really a couple interesting like psychological things. Um, one is that there's a mirror-like quality to this game, where when I provide no context or instructions at all, I, when I watch people play, I can really understand how people relate to games generally. Some people come up and they just wanna like push buttons and play and see what happens and figure it out. Some people wanna just come up and do something and they don't care about figuring it out, they just wanna push buttons. Some people sort of walk up and then like, like start it up and then they wait and then nothing happens and then they don't do anything and then that like loop continues for a few minutes um, and then um, and then some people will like cautiously, cautiously like push one button and be like, okay, what just happened? Like, I did it wrong. Why did I do, how did I do, I did it wrong. Like, I, that sounds bad. Like, I don't even know why I did that. Like, and they would just like self-assess immediate failure in, in their own play experience when there's actually no way to lose this game. There's like no game over state. The string game over is nowhere in the code, code base um, and, um, and never has been. Um, so, uh, and I did that because I want to, I don't want to discourage anyone from making music. So, um, let's move on. Um, oh, I also, um, I also watched people come up one day and like try it and not get it and get frustrated and walk away. So I was standing from a distance and I would watch them and they would, they would come up and they would like do it and they go like, what? And then they would put the controller down and walk away. But then, then they would, some of them came back the next day and they picked up the controller and they immediately got it. So there's something about like the total, the total like unique, like this is something that people hadn't seen before. And they, is like some part of their subconscious like wanted to parse it and understand it, but they, they, they consciously couldn't. And so they, it's almost like they needed to give their brains a rest and like sleep so that their subconscious could process it. Um, uh, there's this great talk that John Cleese gives, gave in the 70s, but is, he still gives it every day on YouTube. And um, um, <laughs> you, you, should, you should all watch this video. It's called John Cleese on Creativity. And he talks about like the subconscious processing of things and like postponing decisions. So it's all about maximizing your own creativity. It's a great talk. Thank you, John Cleese. Moving on. Next prototype is called Tidepool. Um, this one was um, late, la uh, when was this? This was, I guess, um, May, May or June this year, um, and um, is a four-player prototype. It was also I had been fighting this um, this tension between like wanting to make mechanics that work simply on on a keyboard and controller, and so I decided to prioritize controller. Um, so this is a, a controller-based thing. Look, I can look look, mom, I can D-pad. Um, right. So another like total iteration on like the UI and what everything means and what things represent. You can see that there's different waveforms now. Um, and I have a couple of, I have like, I have two player ones. Like, where am I? I'm player one, but I'm in two places at once. What the hell is going on there? Um, I can use the D-pad to switch between quadrants. So this was an experiment about um, y using the quadrants, really, like as associating each instrument with a qu with each quadrant. In this, uh, at this point, I finally had more musical assets. Um, so there's like several synthesizers in this build instead of just one. So I can. Um oh, and there's drums. That's great. And so they all play when they hit their the, their originating playhead. So they have to do a full rotation. Um, right, and then there's this thing in the middle called the color wheel, which is I call it the color key. So I can use the deep or the the analog stick 
to actually shift the modality of of the song of the music. Mu the musical mode is a, a music theory thing, so you can have like um, like Dorian or Phrygian or Mixolydian, and um, this was an attempt to kind of like using some using a filter for uh, for mode to allow players to like change change the mood of the music. So like um, I'll just like try this out. You know what? I'm gonna start this over. I used to have a, a delete all music button, like destroy all music button, and some people really appreciated that, but then I decided I didn't like it because I don't want to give people, uh, the, the thing that I want people to take away from with this is that you can succeed if you just keep trying. So don't give up, don't start over. Um, and don't like self, like the only failure in the game is self-perceived. Um, so if I just, just stick at this one instrument, So you can hear that there's this kind of fundamental shift in, in the mood of the sequence. That's not actually like a baked in change to the sequence. It's a very short sequence, but the, the mode is changing the mood. So, um, so like if I come down here, it's probably really hard to hear with everything going on. And this is one of the reasons I walked away from a lot of these ideas. But there's something really satisfying about being able to choose the sound that you play or have some control um, over like, uh, like pitch selection at any given point. So, um, but the problem with like giving the player the ability to choose any sound, any pitch that they want, means that they only choose what's needed to solve the puzzle. Um, whereas the nice part about previous prototypes had been if you needed a particular block, you had to play through the ones that you don't need, like find safe spaces to put those other blocks where you weren't going to undo your progress in order to get the ones that you need. Um, so um, logically, if I give players control over the pitch, then I also have to give them a lot more rigid of a song structure as a puzzle, and that like reduces the musical uh, affordances that, I'm, that I want to be central to the game. So um, I also, when it's four player, um, it's so easy to just like spam and then like s you can have three people that are really trying to set up like a nice melody and harmony and then you can have one outlier who just like does this and like just messes up everyone's stuff and I was like okay well this reveals something to me about people's tendencies to play of like they want to have fun with whatever whatever is in front of them they don't necessarily want to learn so I walked away from this quadrant based thing um, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Oh my God. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take twelve minutes. Um, uh, right. So this um, um, is uh, pre-alpha two, um, which was like uh, July, and um, so uh, more iteration here, changing the grid a little bit, using this. Um, I'm using this. Uh, Trying to trying to denote like what's selected with the D-pad, um, and using the same kinds of symbols as I did before, um, but now sort of like glued to the front of the block, so that if I put two, if I put like um, whoa, oh, I'm trying to show something. Game, you're not supposed to advance. All right, um, so uh, if I do with this red one, if I do here and then that. This looks like one contiguous red bar, but with the icon there, that sh is trying to denote that there is like actually two different blocks there, two different things. In this, the symbol means the instrument, and the color still means the pitch. Uh, and for the pitches, like I'm using, it's, there's like seven, seven um, uh, notes in a major scale. Um, there's seven colors in the rainbow. Um, so like, hey, Roy G. Biv, and. Uh, a and that that worked. That's been that's been working to an extent, um, and this is it's embodied here. Um, the things that this build does very differently is um, it has no uh, no color for the targets. So all of the targets are like these rhythm targets where it's almost like the inverse rules of the of the other of the of the colorful targets where you have to fill it completely. <coughs> you can't just use one block, but you can put anything you want in there. 
So, and when you do, then this kind of interesting thing happens. Uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate it now. So when I put this last block in this one, you'll see that it like does this thing, right? So you see that that like that like thing, this thing that swirled around. So these are like response blocks in an effort to kind of analyze what the player is doing musically and then reinforce that by duplicating it across the loop. So kind of like allowing the player, like supporting the player's own musical decisions, however conscious they are. Um, and, um, and I think that that works really well. Um, uh, it also does this weird thing, like instead of turning gray, like they become hollow, these blocks, and that wasn't readable. The gray thing wasn't readable for players. This like hollow motif wasn't readable either. Um, so the other thing that I tried is that there's now a relationship between the, there's a resource constraint. So if you have, like you have this set of blocks, like this soundscape available to you to build the song. Um, but each block can only exist in the circle once. So uh, they're like hollow on the outside, they're hollow on the inside, that's confusing. If it's hollow on the outside, then if you select it, it'll start to jitter. And this is trying to tell the player that if you push the button again, you're gonna replace the jittering one with the new one. So once this kind of constraint emerged, um, it, it actually changed something in like the way the game allows you to make more unique rhythms and it like creating space like you can actually create gaps in the grid to put in what you want so this has been like it's actually i should probably as i'm looking at this i should probably study this build a lot more because i think there's some good things going on here that i want to make sure that i ship with um this build um also has um these things called dip switches so here like the the the, the response blocks that i just described i can turn those off um, I had been struggling, and I can turn off the ability to go to freely go back and forth. Um, so uh, I had, um, let's see, uh, I'd been struggling with like having several iterations of this UI, and like the spacing's different, and like what's better and what's worse, and like looking for this like perfect version of the game. But I just kept discovering that there's not a perfect. There's just like trade-offs, positives and negatives for any given design. So in kind of like trying to deal with this code problem that I had of every time I would make some big change, it made it incredibly difficult to go back and undo all that work to like, rem like try to you know, change one interface element. So I started building these dip switches in an attempt to sort of like be able to cherry pick the, the things that were really, really interesting about each of the individual prototypes and allow me to just like toggle them off, on and off um, before any given game. And these, um, these, um, whoa, I'm getting a text. Um, these, um, it was a lovely text from a lovely person. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> so, uh, 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 let's see. Um, they shit, I still have dip switches in the game today. Um, now, let's l look at, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's look at the live version of Centris. I just have to take a moment to appreciate that my game is on Steam. This is like an amazing milestone. I have to applaud Centris because it's almost like it tells me what it wants to be. Like I don't get to tell it what I want it to be. It's just like, Samantha, change this thing. Like do this thing. I'm like, yes, I obey. Um, okay, so this is a, a couple of builds into, uh, a couple of builds later. Um, this is live, this is 20 bucks. Um, and um, it is what it is. It's still like, uh, like I still, when I look at this, I just see nothing but problems with it and like all the things that are still unfixed. Um, but um, it's a product, so I must know what I'm doing. Um, this has a tutorial that's like very long-winded and, and very slowly introduces each one of the, of the elements. It's too long. I would like run over time if I were to start it now, so I'm not gonna show it to you. You can come play it outside. I'll have the computer. Um, so here you ha have a couple of different levels, uh, a couple of different difficulties. Um, you can choose a song, and then you get all this stuff. Here's the dip switches here, which there are a few more, and it's hard to read in this resolution. Um, you, but you can do things like change the tempo, so you can make it go really fast. You can turn off the metronome, which makes it a lot harder to play. You can turn on the free block selection, free left, right selection. You can choose major or minor keys, and you can play any song in any key signature. 
um, which I think is a pretty big accomplishment. Um, and um, then down here, you can't quite see it. Down at the very bottom, it says select synthesizer. Th so this one has, this, this build has guitar, bass, drums, and synthesizer, of which you can choose from one of five synthesizers. So the, what's probably going to happen is like every time you get to a new level, it'll have like, here's your spread of instruments for this level. But then like once you've finished it, then you can go back and play that level with any collection of instruments. Um, I also have um, backgrounds. So I added, um, I worked with a very talented artist named Isaac Moody to do these environments. And um, so this looks very familiar, right? This is shipping today. Um, uh, except you're like, you're not just in a void, you're actually flying through some sense of space. Um, there's like the selector is different. Uh, I turned on free selection so I can still go left and right, but that's off by default. It's like that's the big difference between free play mode and normal puzzle mode is like, can you choose the block or not? Um, You can see there's that transition. I'm really trying to communicate like what's happening with the state of the puzzle. So like making all these things a little bit thinner has been reading more that they don't like fill these gaps that you're trying to fill with the new blocks. So this is working as a, uh, that's working. Like that one problem solved. Um, I've also like mixing up like the colorful targets and the colorless targets. So um, there's still like, uh, level design opportunities to, to incorporate both of them. Um, I can also, yeah, so pretty, <laughs> right? And then you can like, like spaz it out. Okay, um, you can play that on Steam or like just come talk to me. Um, and uh, 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 that's the current version of Centris. Um, so do you wanna see what's next? Yes. Yeah, all right, let's look at Unity. Um, so I just took a working vacation in Iceland for two weeks, and um, it was a, a, a chance to practice like being relaxed and let creativity flow when it wants to flow. I had been fighting with the issue, uh, like the tension between the colors and the symbols. So symbol represented um, instrument in an abstracted way, and color represented pitch in a kind of okay but not very clear way. Um, and the, the, the different colors didn't successfully represent the relationships that different notes have to each other. So if you play like a C and a D at the same time, it doesn't sound great. If you play a C and an E at the same time, it sounds better. And so this, I, I had been like, how do I communicate this relationship to people? So um, this is kind of like what I've landed on. Uh, if you look at my, if you have looked at my Twitter uh, a profile recently, you'll see there's this like kind of circular Several, several circle grid. Uh, I call it the honeycomb. And this is the new symbol for, um, actually let me make sure I have the right level loaded up. This is, the honeycomb is the new symbol for, uh, where is it, level loader. Okay, that's the right level. You can see that there's um a, like a, this isn't there's an inverse between the colors and the symbols. Um, you can change different instruments, and it's a lot more. It just puts the name of the instrument right there, so that there's no question about it. Um, it doesn't show all of the of the uh, uh, the available blocks in the soundscape at once. So you can really kind of like selectively focus on what you want to focus on. Um, I think, I don't know, but I think that this also makes it pretty clear um, what block you have selected. Um, so this is like super, super early. I don't have like, um, 
I don't have, I don't ha currently have blocks that play more than one sound at a time, so everything is just like one filled in circle on the honeycomb. But then like as, um, like as that last blue and orange come back around, you can see that, you can see what it sounds like. And across different instruments, like I think that this gives people some kind of like grounding or some um, clear uh, 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 affordance, for lack of a better term, to, to, to understand the different notes and the relationships. So if you play a chord that doesn't sound so good, you can see like, well, these two together, like that's what doesn't sound so good. And if I really make that transparent about like, this is, like you're seeing what you're hearing, um, then, then uh, I think that that's gonna help people enjoy making music without having a background in musical theory. Um, and uh, 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 it's also like, I like the fluidity of this. I think that's really cool. So um, I think that I'm gonna be pushed off the stage in a moment, but um, uh, uh, this also opens up the opportunity to have instrument and pitch-based targets. And that makes me feel good about like a progression of the game. So that's Centris and that's Rapid Failure Theory, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would love to take questions, yes. Thank you. So, so the, the, the question is, um, um, do, does, do icons add too much complexity? Um, they add, they, so uh, I've been wanting to keep the game very simple for as long as I can. And um, I, I, I actually think that it's a failure that it's a three button game, not a one button game. Um, and the thing is that when, in the past, when I've had no visibility into the pitch, I've had, had an overwhelming amount of feedback of I want to know what it's going to sound like before I play it. And I think that that's fair. I, and it's actually not, it's to, to, to be transparent about the symbols and about the pitches and the colors, it's not introducing more complexity. It's actually just revealing the complexity that's already there. Um, and this definitely plays into level design where at first I don't, like the, the symbols, there's just too much for people to get familiar with before I start throwing them symbol targets. So start with color targets. If you put bass here, you're good. If you put bass and guitar, guitar here and here, you're good. And that's, just have fun doing that for a while. And then we can like ramp you into it. So, um, I mean, I, in some ways I do agree that it seems more complex, but I think it's the right level of complexity. Right. Um, so actually, I, one thing I forgot to mention is that just recently in the, Ste in the, in the live version now on Steam, you have a third button. So there was, there was like the chord thing and then there was the play, but now there's a third button which is like a preview. So you can hear it before, before it stacks. Um, and I, I think that there's huge value in that. Um, it is like my secret mission to get people more familiar with, with musical terms like in a, in, a, in a gentle way. So in that sense, like he seeing the symbol and hearing the sound, uh, I think is powerful. I mean, there's still like, I don't know yet. Like that could be a false. That could be a false statement. Why a non-letter based system? Why a non based system? Um, uh, it's already so intimidating to make music that um, I don't want. I don't want people to feel like they're being educated. And 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 I mean, I want it to be like like the symbols like kind of mysterious. I'm like, what is that? And like. And it's also like, uh, you can, it's like inception, like, wah, like you get people familiar with something before they realize what they're learning. And then suddenly they like, you know, a month later they're like, oh yeah, like, oh, 
oh wow, you know, maybe they play it on a piano and they're like, that's what that symbol is. One more? Or? Yeah. How do I uh, receive feedback and make decisions? Um, I think that in-person playtesting is by far the most valuable. Um, I was surprised at the lack of engagement uh, that the prototype, c the prototype group offered. I almost like had to twist their arms to tell me what they thought of these. Like I'd send it, throw it over the fence, and like, what do you guys think? Crickets. Um, so um, at the same time, I th I think that people also. People also trust me to make something great, and they want the game to be great. And I think that they know that I understand it better than they do, and that is not done. So in some ways, they trust me, and I'm trying to trust myself more than like crowdsourcing the solutions to the problems of like, like the honeycomb thing would have never come about if I had like asked people about symbols because uh, I would have <coughs> received feedback of like don't have the symbols but they're important so uh, you know I'm trying to give myself space to like let the ideas emerge give them space to sit in the game and then over time how do I feel about them and then like is that good or bad so I incorporate feedback when I can but I'm also like allowing myself to be the artist creating the game Thank you.